and welcome to the History Network.org podcast. If you would like to become a patron of the podcast, go along to patreon.com forward slash the History Network. Thank you to all our patrons who make this podcast possible. The History Network.org podcast, season 34, episode 4. Bushmen Against the Boers, Australians in the Boer War. This episode was written by Murray Darm. Murray is an ancient and medieval military historian from New Zealand living in Australia. He has written more than 100 articles on various aspects of ancient and medieval military history as well as other historical topics from all periods ranging from the history of opera to the runic alphabet and recipients of the Victoria Cross. He is author of Macedonian Phalangite versus Persian Warrior, Athenian Hoplite versus Spartan Hoplite and Leuctra 371 BC, all from Osprey Publishing. He is a regular on the Ancient Warfare podcast as well as on here. When the Second Boer War was declared on October the 11th, 1899, governments of colonies from around the British Empire offered to send troops to contribute to the British war effort. This included the governments of the six colonies of Australia. Australia would not be confederated into a Commonwealth until January the 1st, 1901. Among the troops sent were the 1st Tasmanian Imperial Bushmen's Contingent, a unit whose members would be awarded two Victoria Crosses. Most of the troops the colonies of Australia contributed were mounted units, formed before departure. This was despite a decree requesting infantry contingents as being of most service and cavalry of the least. Australians who enlisted in British units or South African colonial units and recruitment for British units such as the Scottish horse was undertaken in Australia. The Australian contribution to the war effort took place over five waves. The first coming in 1899 immediately after the outbreak of the war and drawn from the men of the colonial militia. The second wave included the Bushman contingents arriving between December 1899 and February 1900, recruited widely and paid for by public subscription or sponsored by wealthy individuals. The third wave of Australians were the Imperial Bushmen contingents, recruited in a similar manner but paid for by the Imperial Government in London. After that came draft contingents raised by the state governments of the new Commonwealth and then the new federal Commonwealth government contributed Australian Commonwealth horse troops. Some of these troops were still aboard their ships on their way to South Africa when peace was declared in May 1902. In all, about 16,000 Australian men served in South Africa although some put that number as high as 20,000, along with 80 women. Australians were valued in South Africa for their abilities to ride and shoot. In many ways, the terrain they were used to traversing in Australia matched that of the felts of South Africa. The Australians were also resourceful and used to enduring the harsh and unforgiving environment of the Australian bush. All these things should have proved positives in South Africa, despite their enthusiasm for the cause and their general suitedness to the land. However, many Australians arrived in South Africa without much training. The colony militias only trained a few hours a month, and their service did not require much of them. Similarly, their officers had little training, despite some efforts to remedy this. Captain Charles Cox had led members of the New South Wales Lancers to Aldershot in England to undergo training in 1899. The disparity in the Australian outlook on life and the British military training and leadership 
were evident in South Africa, but would become more pronounced during the First World War. The misfit of the Australian mindset and British military discipline in South Africa was symbolised by the fate of troopers Harry the Breaker Morant and Peter Hancock court-martialed and executed in February 1902. Tensions had been building between the Boers and Britain since the Napoleonic Wars. The two Boer republics, the South African or Transvaal Republic and the Orange Free State, formed in the 1850s, were recognised by Britain, but tensions continued to grow. This led to the First Boer War in 1880-81. Gold was discovered in the Transvaal in 1886 and many foreigners, especially British, flocked to the gold fields. Diamonds were also discovered and this exacerbated the problems. Britain wanted to incorporate the Transvaal and the Orange Free State into a federation under British control and agitated for the rights of British citizens within Transvaal as well as control of the gold fields. Negotiations broke down in June 1899 and a series of ultimatums led to war being declared on Britain by the Transvaal Republic and the Orange Free State. As early as July 1899, the Australian colony of Queensland offered to send troops and troops were requested from New South Wales and Victoria that same month. The first of these contingents arrived in South Africa in November 1899. As such, Australian troops were involved in the three phases of the war. The first phase, when British infantry were defeated and besieged by more mobile Boer troops, took place between October and December 1899. The second phase, between December 1899 and September 1900, saw the British counter-offensive and most towns in South Africa coming under British control. The third phase between September 1900 and May 1902 saw a largely guerrilla war waged between mounted Boer commandos and British mounted units. The first Australian units arrived too late, however, to be involved in the defeats of the Black Week. December 10th to 17th, 1899, when more than 2,000 casualties were inflicted on the British by the Boers in three separate engagements. Australian troops were involved with the cavalry of Major General John French at the relief of Kimberley and then at the Battle of Pardberg in February 1900. Trooper John Hutton Bisdy arrived in the third Australian wave with the first Tasmanian Imperial Bushmen's contingent on May 28, 1900. He had been born in the small Tasmanian community of Melton Mowbray in 1869, some 50 kilometres from the colony capital in Hobart. His grandfather had travelled to Van Diemen's Land in 1821, its name changed to Tasmania in 1856 to remove the stigma of the former penal colony. Educated in Hobart, John had then worked the family holdings at Hutton Park, Melton Mowbray, until he enlisted in April 1900. The first Tasmanian Imperial Bushmen's contingent arrived with 121 men and 133 horses, having set sail from Australia on April 26. His unit was involved in the later phases of the British counter-offensive. Following the defeat at Paderberg, the Boers relied more and more on guerrilla tactics performed by fast-moving mounted irregular units. In response, the British relied more and more on their own mounted units and especially those from Australia to whom the irregular nature of the war now seemed best suited. This was despite the incredibly harsh conditions for both horses and men. The Australians lost more men to disease, 282, than were killed by enemy action throughout the war. The total number of Australian war dead was 598. 
several components of the various Australian contingents simply ceased to exist due to the number of men succumbing to illness. The units with BISDES, the 4th South Australians and 4th Western Australians, formed the 4th Imperial Bushmen under Lieutenant Colonel Rowell. They proceeded to Port Elizabeth and from there were given a role of encircling the Boers in the Witabagan Basin, a Boer mountain stronghold in the northeast Orange River colony. A supply colony destined for Lindley and defended by the Tasmanians was attacked by General Piet de Wet's forces, but these were driven off. Tasmanians were then transported by train to Pretoria in August and then on the 16th marched to join General Paget at Lindley. They subsequently saw hard fighting, one account stating that the men were under fire virtually every day. The Tasmanians joined the Mounted Brigade, where they were usually employed as the advance guard, especially when enemy contact was expected. Conditions in South Africa were atrocious. There was little time to acclimatise and the horses fared especially poorly, dying of disease and exhaustion on the long treks, not to mention in battle itself. None would return home because of Australia's harsh quarantine regulations at the time. During the Boer War, the relatively large numbers of Australian troops first popularised the Bush ballad Waltzing Matilda, singing it on campaign as a quintessential element of Australianness, if not an unofficial national anthem. The lyrics by poet Banjo Patterson were first published in 1895 and set to a much older Scottish tune. During the Boer War, British soldiers who already knew the tune may have even come up with a parody, The Bold Fusilier, also known as Marching Through Rochester. Several units of fusiliers served in South Africa, and although the song refers to the Duke of Marlborough, no evidence of the song existing before 1900 has been found. It was published in that year. It is attractive to think that Australians incessantly singing about the swagman under the Coolabar tree inspired their British comrades to poke fun at them by making up a bush ballad of their own. In total, six Australians were awarded the Victoria Cross for bravery in South Africa. None sums up the quality and bravery of the Australian soldier better than the first three. Medical officer Lieutenant Neville Howes, Trooper John Bisdy and Lieutenant Guy Wiley. The son of a Crimean War veteran and doctor, Neville Reginald Howes, was born in Stogersey, Somerset, in 1863. Qualifying as a doctor in 1886, he migrated to Australia in 1889 for health reasons, weak lungs, and set up his own medical practice in the New South Wales city of Newcastle, then in the town of Tarry. Deciding to become a surgeon, he returned to Britain to attend the Royal College and returned to Australia in 1899, setting up a practice in the central New South Wales town of Orange. When war was declared by Britain on the Boer Republics in October 1899, Howes volunteered for military service with the second contingent, New South Wales Army Medical Corps. Commissioned as a lieutenant, he departed for South Africa on January the 17th, 1900, arriving in Cape Town on February the 18th. He contracted typhoid and was hospitalised for eight weeks. In May, fighting near Dornkop, about 11 kilometres west of Johannesburg, a recovered house was mentioned in dispatches for his work treating casualties in the field. Two months later, he was attached to a column of the 4th Brigade of Mounted Infantry, commanded by General Ian Hamilton under Brigadier General Charles Parker Ridley, and chasing the formidable and most eagerly sought Boer General Christian de Wet. De Wet had served as a field cornet in the first Boer War, fighting in the victory at the Battle of Majuba Hill in 1881. 
In the Second Boer War, he had participated in several of the Boer successes early in the war, participating first as a burger without rank in the Heilbronn Commando, but rapidly gaining promotion to the highest commands. He participated in the Battle of Ladysmith at Nicholson's Neck in October 1899, which saw the surrender of 954 British men and officers. He then participated in the Siege of Ladysmith and was made General Piet Cromier's second-in-command in December. When the British advance began in February 1900, De Wet's men raided and harassed the advance. De Wet was made Commander-in-Chief of the Free State Forces in early March 1900 after the surrender of Piet Cromier at the Battle of Paderberg on February 27th. Despite being continually hunted, De Wet continued to evade British forces, mounting several successful raids and conducting copybook guerrilla warfare. His men also annihilated several isolated British posts and mounted several surprise attacks, such as on Sana's post near Blomfontein and at Reddersburg. On the morning of July 24th, 1900, at the small hamlet of Vredefort in the Orange Free State Orange River Colony, Britain's name for the occupied territory, Ridley's column caught up with the rear of De Wet's. Rather than make their escape as was usual, De Wet's men turned and counter-attacked ferociously. Ridley's men were forced to withdraw due to the weight of fire coming from the Boers. The Boers pressed their attack and the British troops were forced to withdraw a second time. As the bugler rose to sound the retreat, he was shot in the stomach. Despite heavy enemy fire, Howes immediately mounted a horse and rode to the bugler's assistance. Dismounting to tend to the man's wounds, he had been shot through the bladder. Howes dressed his wound. In the meantime, however, the horse was killed. Despite the intensive firing crossfire, Howes raised the man up and carried him on his back to safety, behind the line of Ridley's men. There he immediately went to work to sew up the man's punctured bladder while the combat continued around him. On September 1st, 1900, a 20-man squadron of the 1st Tasmanian Imperial Bushmen's contingent were under the command of 20-year-old Lieutenant Guy Wiley. Wiley would also be awarded the Victoria Cross for his actions that day. The Tasmanian contingent were, as usual, in advance of the main force at Warmbad, near Ruicop, Transvaal, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Herbert Plumer. At Warmbad, a group of eight men split off to pursue some 350 Boer cattle. They entered a narrow gorge, rocky and thickly wooded, when a small force of Boers opened fire from cover, immediately wounding six of the eight Tasmanians including Bisdy, Wiley and the other officer. One trooper, Brown, was wounded and later died. Corporal Brown was also grievously wounded. Guy George Edgerton Wiley was born in Hobart in February 1880. His father, Edward, was an officer in the Indian Army and young Guy travelled to India with his father before returning to Hobart in 1885, although he finished his secondary schooling in Adelaide. In 1900, he enlisted as a lieutenant in the 1st Tasmanian Imperial Bushman's Contingent. In his citation, Trooper Bisdy, incorrectly termed a private, was one of an advanced scouting party passing through a narrow gorge when the enemy suddenly opened fire at close range and six of the party of eight were wounded, including two officers. The horse of one of the wounded officers bolted and Trooper Bisdy dismounted, put the officer on his own horse and took him out of the range of the very heavy fire. Wiley's citation gives more details of the engagement. That officer, seeing that one of his men was badly wounded in the leg, Corporal Brown, and that his horse was shot, went back to the man's assistance, made him take his, Lieutenant Wiley's horse, and opened fire from behind a rock to cover the retreat of the others, 
at the imminent risk of being cut off himself. Wiley's covering fire was considered instrumental in saving others of his men from death or capture by Colonel T. E. Hickman, quoted in the citation. Bisdy and Wiley were the first two of the 14 Tasmanians who have been awarded the Victoria Cross after successfully extracting themselves. The overall action was a success. Seven boars were captured as well as a 100 rifles, 40,000 rounds of ammunition, two supply wagons and the 350 cattle. During the action, Bisdy was wounded and as a result he was invalided home in December 1900. His arrival back in Tasmania was something of a major event and he was welcomed by crowds at the train station. His and Wiley's Victoria Crosses were gazetted in November 1900. Wiley convalesced in Britain and was then commissioned as a second lieutenant in the South Lancashire Regiment in December 1900. In a report from January 1901, however, the Times reported that Wiley had been wounded again and he was invalided to England in March. Wiley was well enough recovered that he received his Victoria Cross from King Edward VII on July 25, 1901 at Buckingham Palace. Brisdy would receive his medal in Hobart in August 1902. Once recovered from his wounds, Bisdy too re-enlisted, this time as a lieutenant in No. 1 Company 2nd Tasmanian Imperial Bushmen's Contingent and set sail for South Africa once more. Soon after the action at Vredefort, Lieutenant Howes was captured by the Boers, but released as a non-combatant. He was promoted to captain in October and then invalided to Britain in November 1900 due to ill health, something which would plague the rest of his career. He therefore did not return to Australia with his contingent which left South Africa in December 1900. On recovery in England, Howes travelled back to Australia in February 1901. It was there that he learned of his award, which was gazetted in June 1901. The gazette entry is brief indeed, even though his citation incorrectly names him as House. He was presented his medal in Sydney in December 1901 at Victoria Barracks, the first Australian to be awarded the Victoria Cross, and he remains the only Australian medical officer recipient. Present at the investiture were two recipients of the Victoria Cross who had subsequently moved to New South Wales. Both men had been awarded the medal for their actions in the Indian Mutiny in 1857, Alfred Heathcote and John Payton. Bisdy's re-enlistment saw him involved in the third guerrilla phase of the war, arriving with 253 men and officers and 289 horses on April 24, 1901. Bisdy continued to serve in South Africa until the end of the war. The Tasmanians joined General John French in the Cape Colony and were in regular contact with various enemy commandos. They then joined Major General Harry Scobell's column and were formed into a flying column under Colonel Gorringe. They were incessantly employed for 12 months according to the official war record. Many of these operations began with long rides at night followed by an attack on a Boer commando the following morning. Another Australian mounted contingents experience can be considered typical between August and December 1901, the New South Wales Mounted Rifles rode 3,000 kilometres and were involved in 13 skirmishes. These resulted in 5 dead and 19 wounded, in return for 27 boar dead, 15 wounded and the capture of a further 196. The 2nd Tasmanian Imperial Bushman's contingent suffered 6 deaths and 16 injured or otherwise struck off. Bisdy was mentioned in dispatches during his service with this contingent. On May 22nd, 1902, the contingent embarked at Durban for Hobart, arriving home on June 25th. Howes also returned to South Africa 
as major with the AAMC, Australian Army Medical Corps, in March 1902. By that time, as of January 1st, 1901, Australia had confederated as a nation, so its troops now served under a national banner rather than being contingents from each colony as they had been in 1899 and 1900. Howes was co-commander of the Medical Corps with Major T.A. Green, Green in charge of the field hospital, and Howes of the Bearer Company. They arrived in Durban and then travelled by rail to Natal, then on to Clerksdorp, Western Transvaal, where the field hospital was established. Howes and the Bearer Company were attached to Thornycroft's mounted infantry column, led by Colonel A. W. Thornycroft of the Royal Scots Fusiliers. The unit had served with distinction throughout the war. Howes once again became seriously ill and was invalided to Britain once more on July 6th. The Australian forces left South Africa for home only two days later. John Bisty returned to Hutton Park, although he was still a celebrity. He received his Victoria Cross from the Governor of the State on August 11th, 1902 in honour of the coronation of King Edward VII, which had taken place on August 9th. Bisdy's wedding in Hobart in 1904 was also a major state event. He then joined the 12th Australian Light Horse Tasmanian Mounted Infantry and became the regiment's commanding officer in 1913. In July 1915, he joined the Australian Imperial Force, AIF, as a captain in the 12th Light Horse and departed for Egypt that November. He served in active operations until wounded in 1916, and was promoted eventually, reaching the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, and was Assistant Provost Marshal in Egypt. Bisdy was appointed OBE in June 1919. He died at home in Tasmania in 1930. Guy Wiley was promoted to lieutenant in March 1902 and then transferred to the Indian Army. He was aide-de-camp to Herbert Kitchener in 1906 and promoted to captain in 1909. At the outbreak of World War I, he was promoted to staff captain in December 1914 and brigade major in September 1915. He was mentioned in dispatches in June 1916 and again in May and December 1917. He was awarded the DSO in the 1918 New Year's Honours List. He continued to serve in the Third Anglo-Afghan War and promoted to Lieutenant Colonel in 1926. He then served as the aide-de-camp to King George V and was promoted to Colonel in 1930. He was again mentioned in dispatches in 1931, 1933 and 1934 for ongoing conflicts in India. In 1933, he was made a Companion of the Order of the Bath. He retired that year, and although he was eligible, he was not recalled to service during the Second World War. He died in Surrey in 1962 at the age of 81. After the war, Howes married in 1905 and remained a major in the AAMC Reserve. He was elected Mayor of Orange in 1914, but the First World War cut short his term in August 1914, and despite being already over 50, he was appointed Principal Medical Officer to the Australian Navy and Military Expeditionary Force to German New Guinea, especially the island of New Britain on August 19th as a lieutenant colonel. Probably based on his own experiences, he personally organised for drugs applicable to a tropical campaign and to protect against typhoid and smallpox be available. He returned to Australia in time to sail with the first convoy of the AIF to Egypt. In December 1914, he was promoted to Colonel and made Assistant Director of Medical Services, 1st Australian Division. At Gallipoli, in late April 1915, he personally organised the evacuation of the wounded from the crowded beach in extreme circumstances and under enemy shell fire. 
There he was described by his commanding officer, Chief of Staff Colonel Sir Brudenell White, as giving and disregarding orders in a manner quite shocking but strangely productive of results. Shells and bullets he completely disregarded. To the wounded he was greatness itself. He was mentioned in dispatches and appointed CB in July. He sought to combat venereal disease among the Australian troops and established the Anzac Medical Society to disseminate information among medical personnel. He was made commander of Anzac, Australian New Zealand Army Corps, medical services in September 1915 and then in November director of the AIF's medical services as Surgeon General. This ensured that the AAMC was independent from British medical authority in the Royal Army Medical Corps. When the IIF moved to Western Europe in 1916, Howes set up his administrative HQ in London, but visited the front frequently and maintained control over the AAMC in both Egypt and Palestine, as well as France. In January 1917, he was promoted to Major General and appointed KCB. He introduced surgical and resuscitation teams with each division. He reorganised field ambulances into two sections, an idea rejected in 1916 but adopted in 1918. As the war drew to a close, he advised the Australian government on the return of crippled soldiers and medical repatriation. A fellow AAMC officer described him as one of the outstanding Australians of the Great War, one of the most remarkable and self-sacrificing medical administrators any military force has ever known. Howes received several more honours appointed KCMG and made a Knight of the Order of St John of Jerusalem in 1919. He returned to Australia in January 1920 and spoke out on the successes of the AAMC in making and keeping the AIF healthy, things which should benefit all Australians in peacetime. He was again elected Mayor of Orange in 1921, but once more only served for a short term. He resigned his army commission in November 1922 to become a Member of Parliament. As an MP, he attended the Fourth Assembly of the League of Nations in 1923 and then served in the government of the Prime Minister Stanley Bruce as Minister for Defence and Health and other ministries between 1925 and 1929. He was ahead of his time, seeking to improve public health and promoting maternity allowances and the welfare of returned servicemen. He was a pioneer in the treatment of venereal disease and cancer, setting up one of the world's first radium banks in Australia in 1928. He lost his seat in the 1929 election and travelled to England for cancer treatment in February 1930, but died in London in September of that year, survived by his wife, two sons and three daughters. For the centenary of Howes's bravery, he was depicted on a $1 coin and a postage stamp in Australia, and a sculpture was commissioned for the Royal Australian College of Surgeons, an institution he founded in 1928. Both Bisdy and Wiley's Victoria Crosses are on display in the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery, Hobart. Houses is on display at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. These three men began a long tradition of Australian bravery, of which the nation continues to be proud. In total, 96 Australians have been awarded the Victoria Cross, 28 of them posthumously, six in the Boer War, 64 in the First World War, two during the Russian Civil War, 20 in World War II and four in Vietnam. Five men have received the Victoria Cross for Australia, three of whom are still living. Thank you once again, Murray, for writing for us. If you would like to write a script for us or you have an idea for a subject for us to record a podcast on, which you've not heard before and would like to hear, then for either of those reasons, just drop us a line, info at 
thehistorynetwork.org. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the historynetwork.org podcast, written by Murray Darm, read by Nick Barker. Thank you.